Hello everyone, welcome to Thursday here at the Northeast Georgia History Center. We have a great big treat for you today. We are going to be looking at weapons through the ages. Now, for purposes of space and, and, and access to things, we're going to be looking at hand weapons, something that people would use with their hands or on their person. That means, unfortunately, we're not going to be able to talk about catapults or cannons or interballistic missiles or anything like that. It's all going to be very much by hand. And so I'm going to jump right in. And of course, you know, the, you have to remember that, that weapons are meant really as a way to impose your will on someone else. They cause physical harm to a body, or at least their presence can potentially imply the, 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 the harm to another physical person, a physical person's body, if they don't comply with what you're looking for. So I'm going to go and look at, you know, one of the first weapons that, that humanity ever discovered was, of course, mass, right? Just, just picking up something heavy and hitting with it. Um, this happens to be a, a Native American war club. So this is, this is made of wood. Uh, you see it has a ball up top to give it some mass, but this is, basically operates the exact same way as any club or mace would, right? You have it. It's a big, heavy thing. It's a baseball bat wielded in an inappropriate manner would, of course, be the exact same thing. You're going to take a weapon like this, and you're just going to bring it down and, and hit somebody with it. So these, these types of weapons, even though they're the most basic, they're some of the most fundamental um, weapons. They're some of the earliest and some of the most common weapons throughout all cultures and throughout all human history, all the way up. To the present day, our law enforcement officers, of course, when they're trying to use something non-lethal, some of them may have batons that they carry on their person or with their belts that are, that are basically just advanced metal clubs. So a club like this in the hands of a Native American, uh, someone in Asia, someone in Africa, someone in Europe is going to be used very much the same way. You're going to want to strike someone and cause damage to their body if possible. And that's something you have to remember as we go forward talking about these weapons. There are really two types of weapons I'm going to be talking about today, and there's a very strong demarcation. There are weapons that use the strength of the wielder to impart some sort of physical interaction between the weapon and the intended target, right? It's, it's muscle power. It's, it's, it's manpower. Where these are going to, so the harder you swing this, the faster you swing this, the more damage you're going to be able to do. Another weapon that is, of course, goes back to the very beginning is something with a point. Now, this particular one sort of represents a, uh, a medieval weapon, a spear, right? We all know what a spear is, but there's something long. So that club, I have to get up close to you to use it. But look, if I've got a spear, I can be far away. And so even, you know, Neanderthals realized that if they pointed a stick, or even better yet, could take a rock point, a flint tip, and put on the end of that stick, they had something that could penetrate flesh more effectively and could provide a way to, to sort of, you know, poke someone from a distance, right? You're able to get a, a long distance away with a spear like this. So they tried to uh, think of other ways that they could project that physical force onto, onto something else, whether it was a, a person or an animal if they were hunting, uh, and one of the things you can do, of course, with a spear is you can throw it. Well, that does increase the range, but once you throw your spear, your spear is gone. So they began to think of, of other ways they could do this. And, of course, one of the big advances in weapons technology for humans was, of course, the bow and arrow, right? A bow is simply a, a bent piece of wood with a string, uh, and depending upon when and where we're talking, how long ago, what culture. The string could be made of hair, sinew, uh, hemp, linen, lots of different things. And of course today, we still have bows. Lots of folks still go hunting with bows. And, and eventually they also developed a way to cock a bow, to pull the bow back and leave it there. That's how the crossbow happened. But the very first ones, of course, were very basic arrows. This one has, of course, feather fletching. That's what allows the, the arrow to stay stable in its flight, and this one has a, has a flint tip. You can see just that's, that's very, very common. Lots of, lots of folks here in the southeast and probably around the country, if you're used to going into a garden spot or something, depending upon where that is, it might have been the site of an old Native American um, family or village 
and there you can find literally hundreds of projectile tips. And of course a bow is going to work the same way. You'll put the arrow on the bow and you'll pull it back like this and the tension on the wood and the string when you let it go are imparted onto the arrow, right? And so the arrow goes flying and you're able to have more of these. So you're able to send that force out far beyond you and you're able to have a lot of these in reserve. Now I'm going to go ahead and skip a little bit since we're talking about a bow and over time in the, in the ancient wars and in the medieval period when the bow sort of really came into its own because it was being used effectively in mass concentrations, they began to have different types of arrows. Of course they evolved from stone tips like this to steel tips. And I have some examples of different types of tips that we have here. And you know, sometimes you think, well, how many kinds of tips are there? there? There are several. So this one, this, uh, let me pull it out. This nasty looking one here uh, is actually a hunting tip, right? So the, you can see the arrows have advanced a little bit. Uh, the, the fletchings, there are three of them. They're not uh, sort of haphazard. They're in a very specific pattern to allow the arrow to fly more stably. And this big tip is, is not meant to attack people in armor. This is meant to attack flesh, right? So this is a great deer hunting tip. And when you go hunting, you're only going to carry two or three arrows with you because you're not having to shoot a lot. You're wanting to take down one animal and bring it home to eat. But of course, you know, with, with different times, uh, different uses of the bow, you're going to have different types of tips. Here's a somewhat modified tip from that one. It's, it's got a broader tip on it. This is the kind that would be in use uh, in ancient Rome and in the early medieval period, right? It's, it's very basic, sort of a diamond shape, sort of multi-purpose. Uh, you can sharpen the edges here, and this, this flies through the air. It's going to go through flesh pretty easily. And there are different ways to attach these arrowheads. This, of course, these have cones, metal cones on them, but you could also have a shaft coming down from the tip and the shaft could go into uh, the wooden part and just be tied on. And you see this head is sort of leaf shaped. It can go in and this can be easily withdrawn. These other two, not so much. But when it comes to using arrows and, and, and bows for war, you start to develop very specific types of tips that might defeat the armor that you come upon. Uh, one of the first is these. So around the 1100s in the time of the Norman Conquest, you're gonna get an arrow tip like this. Notice it's a little bit smaller, it's a little more diamond shape, it has a little bit more rigidity to it. This can obviously go into an unarmored opponent, but you might have a chance to poke through some chainmail armor. Uh, if any of you saw our show on the Crusades, you know what chainmail looks like. This might have a chance to defeat that. Well, they began to go even further, and they developed this, this awful thing called a bodkin point. You can see how narrow and needle-like and sharp this is. Right? And so this could go into those little rings of mail and penetrate them and, and burst those rings apart, even though they're riveted together, and could go deep into an armored opponent. Well, when people began to armor themselves in full plate to sort of try and defeat that kind of arrow tip, they began to develop these multi-purpose. And this is the kind of arrow heads you're going to see in the Hundred Years' War. At the, at the height of the bow, especially the English longbow, sort of a multi-purpose. It's got the barbs on it. It's got those uh, a wider tip to perhaps impart energy and penetrate a piece of plate armor, but this is also going to be able to do a great job against chainmail, a great job against flesh. Um, and so these bows, you know, how strong are these bows? Well, some of the earlier bows, like the Native American bows and some of the early European bows, might have a draw weight. That's how many pounds it would take to pull that string back of no more than about 20 to 30 to 40 pounds. However, by the height of the English longbow, some of those bows can be 100, 120, 130 pounds of draw weight. And it takes a very long time and a very special sense of training to get to the point where someone could actually pull that bow back and let that arrow go in a consistent aimed fashion. That's one of the great things about the English longbowmen. They trained from the time they were young boys to use that kind of bow. So we're going to leave bows and arrows behind for just a second. We're going to come back to projectile weapons in a moment, but now we're going to go back to some of those close-in weapons. And, and, and as metallurgy developed and people began to develop 
at first bronze and then iron and then eventually steel, they begin to realize that that concept of a club, of having something you could swing and hit, could be created into something even more deadly. And so you get some things like swords, right? So this is a typical Greek sword. You notice it sort of has a leaf-shaped tip. It kind of narrows here and then winds back up to a point. And this sword can, of course, be used to hack, to cut something like this, or it can be used to stab. You could stab right through someone with this point. Um, and again, the ancient Greek. The Romans eventually come up with a, a, another thing. If you saw our armies of Caesar, this is a Roman sword. And you'll notice that distinct difference in the way the blades look. The Greek sword is very narrow. It sort of had a, has a curved wasp shape to it. This is very parallel, very wide. This sword isn't really meant to be swung. By this point, the Romans have developed a way of fighting so that it's only stabbing. It's only stabbing. And this makes for an incredibly deadly point. It's a narrow point, widens out to a big wide blade. And if this goes into you, it's going to cause a lot of damage. Now, <clears throat> the Romans used this type of sword for about 200 years at the very height, what we think of as the Roman Empire. Um, but they also had a lot of cavalry. And the cavalry couldn't fight from horseback. This sword's simply not long enough. They had, so they basically sort of took this sword and, and, and extended the blade. And if you can imagine this sword with another foot and a half on the end of it, that's called a spatha. And it existed at the same time as this one did, but it was primarily used by cavalry folks. Well, as the Roman legions began to change the way they fought, as they began to focus more on cavalry going into the very, very late antiquity and early Middle Ages, and I'm talking about like the four and five hundreds, uh, perhaps up into the six hundreds, those blades are all going to become the elongated type. So they evolve eventually into what you see here, which is, um, this is a Viking sword. Viking sword that would be around the year seven to eight hundred. Notice that much like that Roman gladius, its edges are still pretty much parallel. It does have somewhat of a point, but this sword isn't really meant to stab with. The length of this sword is going to allow you to really reach out and hit something a good distance away from you, and those Vikings really did. They use their swords in this way. Their, their swords are meant to cut, so they've gone away from that Roman idea of simply stabbing, these Viking swords are primarily designed to cut, right? They're hacking through whatever they may be uh, defending. And this is a good moment to point out too, weapons very often always have sort of a, an artistic and decorative aspect to them. You saw that, that Native American war club, it was very graceful and very carefully carved. Um, Viking swords like this, you can see just those indentations on the hilt. On, uh, on the cross guard and on the pommel here, make this a very pretty thing. And, and you know, besides the beauty of the blade and the craftsmanship that goes into it, um, they're going to try and make these as, as good looking as possible because that's what humans do, right? To use the modern term, we like the bling. And these swords, these single-handed swords are not going to be very heavy. A sword like this is maybe going to be about two pounds, maybe a little bit lighter. And they're not big bars of steel, even though they're only meant to cut. They're going to be very flexible, and they can go right back to straight because these swords have uh, very specific metallurgical properties. They're tempered, right? They can keep an edge, but they will bend a little bit as you use them, and being able to bend a little bit is going to keep them from being broken. So as the Middle, Age, Middle Ages advance, the knights who began to use swords and, and the soldiers under them began to realize maybe we do need to use that point a little bit to, to push through that chainmail armor and later to push through some of that plate armor. So they develop uh, what's called an arming sword, right? And holding these side by side, you can see some of the differences. This Viking sword has a lot of width to it. This one starts out about the same at the bottom, but it, it comes up to a much, much pointier point, right? Which makes it also a little bit lighter. Um, it's still going to be used. It can still be used in the same way, right, to cut, to cut like this. But you're also, because of this fine point, able to thrust with it more and get theirs in. And there's lots of, by the time you get to the, say, the 12 and 1300s, you see swords like this a lot. And 
do you start to see manuals come out? We haven't had any instructions for people to sort of follow to learn how to fight with these, or at least we don't have the records of that is what I should say. But now we start to see manuscripts and books that say, hold your sword a certain way and hold your body a certain way, and that way you can fight, right? You're able to fight a certain way, and, and they're basically giving fighting lessons by this point. Um, so a sword like this, with just a very few changes, is the kind of thing you're going to see in a lot of the medieval period. Um, from the year 1000 all the way up to you start to get to like 1600 even. It's a very, very common design. Again, lots of little small changes, but then the changes do start to come. And next I have um, a Scottish basket hilt. Sometimes you call these a claymore. And you can see that this blade has sort of gone back. You notice things go back and forth sort of gone back to that wider until you get to the tip, uh, and it has this beautiful basket work around it, right? It's, it's a big, heavy, hefty thing, and your hand is protected by this basket work, but again, it also provides a great opportunity for the sword maker to put some beautiful um, artwork on there to make, this, to make this really look nice. And it's interesting because this suddenly becomes, this sword becomes heavier than that medieval sword because of the basket hilt. It totally changes the balance, the, the way the blade is built. The blade geometrics are different too. And so you, when you start to use this, sometimes this basket can kind of get in the way of some of that fancier sword play and it becomes much more of a, again, a, a cutting weapon, right? Uh, and again, this is, we're talking about the, the 1700s um, for a sword like this. And about the same time, especially into the later 1700s, gentlemen began to, began to carry swords, and they once again began reading some of those classic Latin texts on what swords should be like. They said, well, the sword should be used primarily to thrust, not to cut. It's more effective. And looking at those, they decided to make their own sword, and so they come up with something called a small sword. Now, this is a, this is a this is a very significant notice and change, noticeably, noticeable difference in blade geometry, right? This one is super thin. This one is much bigger. But look at the point on this thing. And as you can imagine, this one is much, much lighter. Now, problem is, this one doesn't have any, have any edges at all, right? You can just get a hold of this, and it's not going to cut you. But that point is like a needle. This is where you get fencing, type fighting like this. So the whole point <laughs> is to come to your opponent and thrust at them, right? You're thrusting at their face, at their head, at their body. And a weapon like this, you can still parry with the edges, but if you're not poking it into them, you're not doing it right. This is incredibly light. This may weigh a pound, maybe less. Um, but, it, but it's still an effective fighting tool. It's a great dueling tool, and it's something that the gentlemen of, of, the, of the day are going to rely on. Again, look at the artwork and the beauty on the hilt of this, on, of this sword. Lots of decoration happens in weapons. <clears throat> Later on, they sort of totally changed blade dynamics and we get a curved sword. Now this curved sword is primarily meant to be used by cavalry because if you have a sword that's only usable by the point for a cavalryman, that means that you're only going to be able to hold it out and charge at the guy. But with a curved sword like this, it really is able to use the physics of a, of a horse soldier riding by whoosh, and cutting someone as they go by. That curved blade is sort of able to follow the shape of your arm and the path of the horse and provide the most cutting power. People would also duel with these, but this is more of an, um, a ceremonial sword by this point. We're looking at, you know, very late 1800s, early 1900s, especially a curved saber like this is the sort of thing you would see cavalry using at the height of the Napoleonic War. So these curved swords are a, are a totally different critter, but they still have manuals with these, right? And they're fighting. They have specific ways that they can go about fighting with these, very manualized. Now, we've gotten to the point where we've sort of gone through the history of swords very briefly. But I said I was going to get back to fighting someone from a distance. And even as early as, as the medieval period, they were using bows and arrows. They were using crossbows. 
but they began to develop another weapon. And this is really the demarcation. This is the big change that people see, gunpowder weapons. And a lot of the, uh, most of you, if you saw the promotional material, we had a picture of a medieval looking guy, but he had this weird gun looking thing. And we have one of those here, All right? And this is, this is basically a small cannon on the end of a stick, right? That's all it is. It's a handagana. It is a gun meant to be held in the hand. And you can see it's, it really is just a barrel. It has a little touch hole here, just like a, a miniature cannon would, and it's mounted onto a stick. And the way you set this off is you would place some gunpowder in the barrel. You would place a ball, a lead ball, inside the barrel put a little powder here, and then your slow match. This is a, a kind of rope that's been treated with a chemical. Usually imagine liquefied gunpowder, and it's soaked in that so that when you put a uh, fire to this, it slowly burns, right? Slowly, not just whoosh. And that way, when you get this loaded, you're able to hold this. You can take this, put a little bit of fire on the touch hole, and boom, you fire it this way. Incredibly primitive, but again, the first gunpowder weapons. And you can see I'm not really able to aim this effectively. I can't really use my eyes. I'm sort of having to just guess. And in a lot of the illustrations, instead of having this stick to hold it, they would just take the match cord and hold it out to it like this. So very primitive, but this type of weapon, this gunpowder handheld weapon, began to totally change the face of warfare. And they slowly began to alter it. They developed another weapon with a longer barrel, with a stock more like the rifles we see now, that still use slow match. And that is called an arquebus. And uh, we have a video we want to show you about how an arquebus is used, but take note, it's still slow match. And it really is a pretty drawn out process to load and fire one of these things. And I've also got uh, the handgun coming up if you want to see that first. Oh, yes. Oh, we do have it. Oh, I didn't know we had. Yes, we have a video of the handgun being fired and then we'll go straight into the arquebus so you can kind of see the similarities and the differences. Okay, so I'm just going to need a, just a second. Yeah, give us just a second, folks. The internet has been acting all weird today. <laughs> all right, so we're going to see the handgun first. So let's go to that. All right, so it should work. Let's all right. See if it does. <laughs> let's go to the film. All right, here we go. One second. So here's the handgun. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Okay, here we go. Yeah, now we're going to see a, a little bit longer video on the loading and firing process of an arquebus. Now this is called an arquebus, and the arquebus is a matched lock weapon. This hemp rope here is matched. It's a slow burning fuse, basically. This is hemp rope that's been soaked in a solution of gunpowder and water, and when it dries and you light fire to it, it burns and smolders at a very slow rate. So what I'm going to do now is light this little match. Thank <laughs> you. 